thanks so much for being here. I am so excited to talk about money with this particular crowd because oftentimes we divorce our financial lives from our spiritual lives. And money is not actually a thing. We, we actually made it up as human beings. I think, I can't remember, um, I did the research for my book and of course it's escaping me, but in something something BC, the first record of money came on board and basically human beings created money as a way to create a system so that we could exchange value for value. And that's all it is. So especially in today's economic times when um, the media is whipping us all into a froth about the economy and oh my gosh, there's no jobs and da 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 I don't pay much attention to that because the economy is not something outside of us. It's not this amorphous, big old corporate America, corporate Canada <laughs> thing, right? It's actually us. We're all participating in that. And so when it comes to our money stuff, money is just simply about value. So it's what we value, and then it's also how we value ourselves. Because if, there, if we want more money, and I don't know that many people who don't actually want more money, but what they want is not actually money. They'll say, I want more money, but what they really want is what money can get them. I mean, having a million dollars in your bank account, who cares? That does not keep you warm at night. It will not open your heart, and it won't actually enhance your life. So money is simply a stand-in for what we value. And so when we want more money, we need to actually give more value in the world so that we can receive more value in exchange. And that's all it is. And when we can boil it down to that basic level, it, it makes the whole thing easier. Right, we're in the speak easy. So we wanna, we wanna make everything around the financial conversation easier and fill it with ease because so often it becomes scary, it becomes clenched, it becomes constricted because we think, okay, it's hard, it's boring, I have to read the Wall Street Journal, I have to know all of these terms like IRA, SEP, 401k, I, 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 again, it might be slightly different in Canada, what your systems are, but I think it's fundamentally the same thing, right? Because money is just energy, so it doesn't matter what kind of retirement plan, what it's called. And really, if money is about our value and about valuing ourselves, it's not separate from ourselves, so we don't have to be so scared. In light of that, I would like to queue up, um, I'm going to have you stand up for a moment here. And I'm going to play a little dirty hip hop because <laughs> money is actually about uh, money, where our uh, financial energy hits us is in our second chakra, which is where our reproductive organs live, and it's also the lower back. So it's this general vicinity. So what we want to do is actually activate that energy and get in there because when our financial lives or when our spiritual lives or when our anything lives are a head trip, it's only, we can only go so deep, but when it's a body trip, we can really make the changes and live the lives that we want to live. So we're going to have a little body trip here. So put your feet about hip width, maybe even a little bit wider. Feel free to use the aisles because um, you might want to get big with this. <laughs> and uh, go for it, Karina. And I'm just going to have you follow me. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, so you're going to go really slow, and I just want you to get into your hips like you um, have a spoon attached to your hip and you're um, going around a bowl of really yummy chocolate. Or maybe it's for you, it's like raw cacao, vegan, gluten-free something. <laughs> and feel free to actually touch your hips because that helps be present in the experience. Okay, so these are, this is just a hip circle. You can do them anytime. Let's do the other direction. It's also really great for your yoga practice because it gets into some areas that actually your practice is not going to get into. So there's another kind of hip opening that you can do at any time. Okay. I think that's probably good. Maybe just a fast one. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. For any of you who want to try that at home, that's a song called Money on the Floor. I think it's about strippers. <laughs> so the reason I do that is because, and I actually 
literally will do hip circles when I get into a moment of financial fear, constriction, whatever. Because the truth is, our brains cannot solve our problems. If our brain could do that with the amount of thoughts that we think every day, everybody's lives would be totally perfect. What happens is, if you can tap into this energy, this is the area of money, sex, and power. I'm not gonna talk about the sex part today, even though that would be fun. <laughs> but we'll talk about the money piece and then the power piece, because it is where our personal power lies. And any creativity, any self-worth, any of that energy actually comes from here. So it doesn't come from here down, it comes from here up. So I recommend if you're going to meet with your financial advisor, if you're about to have a difficult conversation about money with your husband or your wife or your partner, if you are about to balance your checkbook or pay bills, do a hip circle. I actually do recommend it. And if you're sitting in a financial meeting, maybe you're going through divorce proceedings and going through the mediation and it's getting really icky and you're feeling all like, you can actually do them little in your chair and nobody will know. So <laughs> I do recommend doing those. So spirituality and money. What's up with that? <laughs> All of the world's major religions would have us, I gotta roll up my sleeves for this, <laughs> would have us believe that it's not okay to want money, that money is evil, that rich people are greedy. And I hear from a lot of people, and, and raise your hand if you've heard this as well, oh, money isn't important to me. And perhaps you've said it yourself. My question to people who believe that money is not important to them is, is your self-value important to you? And is your quality of life important to you? And is your well-being important to you? Because money is not about money, as I said, right? It's about what it stands for. And it's about nourishing ourselves first. So I'll tell you a little story. I went into business with my mom a couple years ago. Some of you might be familiar with her work. She wrote a book called Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. Her name is Dr. Christian Northrup. She's awesome, love my mom. And she and I thought, we had separate businesses with a company called USANA that's a health company. They uh, distribute their products through word of mouth network marketing. I'm a huge fan of that industry. And so we had these businesses and we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could go into business together and I could do the behind the scenes work and she could do the front of the scenes work and we could actually help a lot more people and touch many more lives if we went into business together instead of separating our energy. At the time I was 25 and I thought to myself, oh this will be great. I can team up with my mom's brand with her notoriety, with her vision and that'll be great because I don't ever have to really <laughs> be accountable for what I'm doing. So I didn't think that consciously. In retrospect, that's what I was thinking. So we went about our lives and I was living in New York City at the time. I was living in an apartment that my mother owned. I was going around with my little wheelie bag with my products and services, doing presentations, presenting myself as a women's financial freedom expert in New York City. I actually built up a little following there and doing workshops, it was great. Except for the fact that I felt like a complete and total fraud. I was living literally in my mother's home at the age of 25. I was teaching the concepts of financial freedom, which I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that later because it's important. Um, and behind the scenes, every month my consumer debt was getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it peaked at 20,000 US dollars. That was unfortunate. <laughs> I felt really, um, I, felt like, I felt like a fraud. I felt like I didn't want to tell anybody what was actually going on. And I was most of all, the most important part, I was afraid to even look at that myself. So I became a total avoider. I stopped opening my credit card bills. I stopped opening any sort of mail that looked even remotely financially related. <laughs> I stopped looking at my bank account and I just sort of hoped, right, I grew up in the spiritual world. So I grew up in the, with the personal growth people and the 
Wayne Dyer and Louise Hay and all of these wonderful teachers. And I kind of had it in my head that if I just did enough affirmations and if I just acted as if, right, we've heard that, act as if you have what you want and then you will attract it to you. But what that did is it ended up with me in $20,000 worth of credit card debt. So I had kind of done a spiritual bypass around <laughs> the nitty gritty of what money is actually about. And I wasn't taking responsibility for what was actually going on there. So here I am wheeling my bag around New York City, doing my thing, feeling worse and worse and worse and worse and worse about myself, but being so petrified that I couldn't actually do anything about it. And then one day I was on an airplane, and when I'm on an airplane, I actually found out that there is evidence for this. When I'm on an airplane, I get really good ideas. It feels like I'm closer to God, and you know, I'm up there in the sky, nobody's bugging me, whatever. And I said that on stage and a NASA astronaut came up to me and he said, actually, that's true. There's something about the ions in the air up there that do something to your brain that make you more open to creative ideas. So should you ever be on an airplane, get out your journal. And I was journaling to myself and I was reading at the time Barbara Stanley's book, Overcoming Under Earning, which I can't recommend highly enough. So, BarbaraStanny.com, her book. And I was taking her class, which was about basically getting out of the financial pickle that I was in. And, but I had taken her class a couple times before and had never done any of the exercises. Have you guys ever done that? <laughs> or you read the book and you're like, oh, that's great, that's an exercise page, I'm just gonna keep going. And they, the author will say, like, stop and do this exercise, it won't work without it. And you're like, Psh, not for me. So <laughs> it was my third time actually through this particular work and I decided, okay, well, I'm still in credit card debt and I'm still, I still didn't even know how much because I wasn't paying attention. I wouldn't actually look at it. And so I'm writing around it and I'm like, what's my problem? And what I realized as I was writing, it all kind of came down. I realized, oh, my lack of financial awareness is directly related to a lack of self-care and self-love. Because if money is a stand-in for what we value and we receive money in exchange for the value we provide in the world, if we're having financial issues, that means we're not valuing ourselves. Period, end of story. And in that moment, I realized, okay, if I wanna get out of this debt if I want to become abundant, like truly abundant, not just talking about it and doing affirmations, because you can have an abundance mentality and be like, oh, I'm going to go spend $75 out to lunch because I want to attract that kind of lifestyle. But if you're putting it on your credit card, it doesn't, it, like, it totally doesn't line up. So if you're doing sort of things like that, I'm just going to allow yourself to, you know, you can call yourself out in private. Um, so I realized, okay, so if I want to get out of debt, and this is an issue of self-love and self-care, how can I actually incorporate my financial life into my self-love and self-care practices? And then it became a profoundly important spiritual practice. Until then, I just sort of hoped that somebody would come along and do it for me. Like, I kind of thought maybe um, my mom would fix it. I did. That's why I was in business with her. I thought maybe she might fix it. I thought maybe I would meet a rich guy who would take care of it for me and I wouldn't have to think about it. It's embarrassing to say that out loud because I have like an Ivy League education and it's awful that that thought crossed my mind. <laughs> or, you know, other people have different versions of this. Our white knight comes in many forms. It might be a parent, it might be an inheritance, it might be a job, it might be the government. I live in Portland, Maine, and Maine is the biggest welfare state in the United States. So a lot of people are thinking their Prince Charming is going to be the government. And we're always stepping back and saying, okay, well, this isn't my job. I'm too scared. Who else can do it for me? But because it's an issue of self-awareness, self-love, self-care, I had to redial in and realize, oh, I'm the only one going all the way with me this time around. Right? You've got your parents, and they're there at the beginning. Chances are pretty good they're not there at the end. You have the people you fall in love with. That's temporary, right? It just is. We're the only ones going all the way with ourselves. And the truth is, even if you do meet a great person who cares for you financially, awesome. 
50% of, of, of marriages end in divorce, and the average age of widowhood is 56 years old. So we're talking like that's not a good financial plan. A man is not a good financial plan. A company is not a good financial plan. We know about record downsizing and the issues that people have when they think security means a good job. I don't know if, about the rest of you guys, but I was taught in school, you need to get good grades, so work really hard, get good grades, get into a really good college, and get a great job that will take care of you for the rest of your life. Did anyone else hear that particular formula for success? And how many people in this room, I'm just, I, I don't usually ask this, how many people followed that and are still with the same company they graduated from college and went to work for? One person. <laughs> nice work, that's awesome. <laughs> so it's an exception to the rule, obviously, obviously. And the idea that somebody is going to come do it for us is a bypass of our power because our, our money, sex, and power lives right here. Our money is inextricably linked with our sense of personal power. And so when I realized that, I started putting into place a couple of financial self-care practices that I wanna tell you about, and then I'll tell you the end of the story. Number one, I was so remedial with this, and I was so scared, and I was so in la-la land that the only thing I could get myself to do was look at my bank account balance every morning. That was it. I knew that I needed to pay off my debt. I knew that I should probably read a book or two. I knew that I should do various things, but I had to start really small. So if you're in any sort of financial pickle, whether it's debt, whether it's making less than you spend, whether it's just wanting more money, it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't have to be a pickle. It could be just simply wanting to expand in your financial life. My recommendation is in the morning, when you get up, probably you meditate or do some sort of morning practice. Check your bank account balance after you do that. And look at it and give a little gratitude for what you've got. Because everybody in this room has a roof over their head, has some food to eat, has all of those things. So there are so many ways in which we're abundant right now, which is one of the ways that you can wind your financial practice around your spiritual practice. And so every morning I would get up and I would look at my bank account balance and I would say thank you, even if the number was negative, because sometimes it was. When I stopped using credit cards, I started overdrawing my checking account every day. So it's, it takes practice. <laughs> so that's one thing that I would recommend doing. The other thing that I did is I started renaming bills, um, invoices for blessings already received. So invoices for blessings already received. What that means is, when I get the bill from the electric, from Central Maine Power, that means I've had electricity care of CMP for 30 days. And so an invoice for a blessing already received is a moment, it, it allows you to take a moment and give some gratitude and notice all of the ways that you're, you've already received that blessing and are already enjoying it. So when I pay my power invoice, for my, my blessing, I actually sit there and think about, hmm, think about all those times I walked into my apartment in the dark and flipped on a light switch. How cool is that? How abundant is that that I can do that? And so you wanna start to look at, if you have a bunch, a whole bunch of debt, a whole hill of debt, you wanna look through and take a look at the things that you spent money on. So it could be shoes, it could be trips, it could be seminars, books, maybe it was getting a business started, so there were office supplies in there. You know, I know a lot of people who, in startup mode, Ma MasterCard actually funds their initial business startup. That's all fine and good, totally cool. And you wanna take a look through that and notice, instead of noticing, instead of feeling all constricted and icky about paying your bills, because so many people are, ah, there's not enough at the end of the month. In fact, we'll take a moment and ask you guys, what are some of the things you heard about money growing up? Just some of the phrases or some things that your parents maybe said repetitively or other adults. Yeah, Terry? Doesn't grow on trees. Money doesn't grow on trees. Yeah. That one I love because money actually does grow on trees. It's made, <laughs> it's made of paper and it actually does come from there. So, but yes, money doesn't grow on trees. That's a common one. Meg? You really just don't need that much. Hmm. 
You really just don't need that much. Okay, other ones? Yeah. Money doesn't come without hard work. Money doesn't come without hard work. Mm hmm Okay, great. Yeah. Money doesn't come without hard work. Okay, great. And then right behind? Doesn't buy happiness. Money doesn't buy happiness. <laughs> great, great. Any other ones? Yeah. This one's great, but just do what you love, the money will show up. Do what you love, the money will show up. Sometimes true, sometimes not, if you're not doing it consciously. Yeah, we're going to deconstruct that one. We're going to deconstruct money doesn't buy happiness. Any other ones to throw out in the mix? Yeah. Money makes the world go round. Money makes the world go round. Yeah, what do we think about that? I think gravity makes the world go round, <laughs> right? But money's a big part of it. So all of us live in the Western world, right? You either live in BC or surrounding areas or the states. Or what, I, you might, I don't know where you're from. But <laughs> But you're here, which means you had to spend some money in order to get here. So we all live in societies where we actually don't get to leave this time without dealing with money. So you might as well get in right relationship with it or it will plague you for the rest of your life. It's not that it makes the money go round, or the world go round, but it is that you can't avoid dealing with it. So if it's an issue that's, that's filled with constriction, filled with angst, filled with guilt, there's a lot of guilt around money. If it's filled with just anything negative, that's going to detract from your ability to be a fully embodied spiritual person on the planet, right? So that's why it's important. Okay, any others? No, good, okay. So we're going to do money doesn't buy happiness and then, um, and then do what you love and the money will come. What happens is, when we're little kids, we get information put in. This is not news to you guys because you're at a yoga festival. So I'm going to briefly, <laughs> briefly talk about the fact that we get information when we're kids. It creates this blueprint and then it creates thoughts and beliefs which then in turn create our reality by virtue of the fact that our beliefs impact our actions and create what we do in the world. Right? So it's not magic. It's not that like I think a thought and suddenly I can manifest, you know, some... Louboutins here on the, like some shoes, right? I, that is not how it works, but if I am constantly thinking about um, it, in abundance thoughts and thinking that I'm enough and I'm valuable, I will behave in a way that actually creates a reaction where other people around me treat me as though I'm valuable, I receive more money in turn for that, and I can choose to buy Louboutins if I want to. That's actually not my choice, but it's okay if it's yours. Because I don't value shoes enough <laughs> for the amount of money that it would cost to buy those, but that's a value issue. I have a lot of different um, snippets of information going on, so I may come back to most of them. If I don't, there's Q&A at the end. I'm not a linear speaker, so if I don't wrap something up, feel free to bring me back there afterwards. So the issue with what do we value, I, my friend Marie Forleo said this so well, and I loved how she said it. She said, that when she first started out as a life coach, she had an idea that she had to live in some fancy pants house in New York City, like a townhouse and three floors, and it had to be you know, some $20 million home. And she had that idea that that's what it had to look like, but underneath that, when she really looked at what she wanted and what she valued, she realized she actually, first of all, didn't want that, didn't value it, didn't care. Second of all, didn't want to do what would be required in order to get that in her life. So often we organize our financial lives around what looks good, around what we should be doing, around what our mother thinks would be good for us, or something along those lines. And we're doing it either consciously or unconsciously. I've found myself, a lot of the reason, this is embarrassing to say, a lot of the reason I got into debt was because I was living in New York City in Manhattan in my early 20s, and I, I thought it should look a certain way. So I did various things like I spent money on trips and I spent money on clothes and I spent money on events and seminars and whatever that I thought I should be having, should be doing, even though when it came down to it, just like the, the shoes, did I really value that? No. And the reason we get into debt, into situations where we're over our head financially or feeling, even feeling icky about a purchase. How many times have you spent money on something and then walked away and felt a little like, Nish <laughs> yeah, it happens, it happens a lot. <laughs> One of the best ways to get into right relationship with our money is every time you pull out your piece of plastic or your cash, whatever one you do, or every time you press order on the computer, right? Because that sometimes feels like fake money. You're like, oh, I'm just pressing, I don't, it's different because it's already stored in Amazon. So if I 
just click the button, it doesn't count. <laughs> I said that the other night, I was paying with Canadian dollars and I was like, it's like fake money because it's not really my currency, so I just woo, whatever, right? <laughs> What you want to think about and actually feel, this comes back to the body trip aspect, when making a purchase or when looking through your credit card statement or your bank statement, look through and notice, did I feel expansive when I made that purchase or did I feel contracted? That one tool, that one conscious practice, tapping into you as a spiritual being, right? You as an emotive being, you as a physical being, will change your financial life. I, Karina was like, oh, this talk is gonna change your life. That felt like a lot of pressure. But I think that actually just that one snippet, if you did that consistently, would change your life. Because if you're not spending what you've received, your value, right? So I received money because of my value, because of the value that I've given in the world. I'm not saying that your bank account value is how valuable you are as a human being, right? We're all priceless. So just to be clear on that, <laughs> but, if you are feeling like you're not receiving enough value in the world, it is probably because you're not giving open-heartedly. Um, you're not giving as much value as you could in as creative ways as you possibly could be doing. So if you do that one practice of looking at, okay, am I feeling expanded in this moment of purchase or am I feeling contracted? And if you stop making purchases that make you feel contracted, that's all you need to do. That's it. Everything will just kind of like work itself out. One of the most important aspects of that is looking for possible financial energy leaks because you'll notice a theme. So when you go home, you can get out your most recent credit card statement and look through. And I would recommend like highlighting in pink the, the, the purchases that made you feel expansive and then maybe putting like a sad face next to the ones that made you feel contracted, something like that, whatever system works for you. And then go through and see if the ones with the sad face, if those have anything in common. Are they all related to the same person? Are they all possibly related to the same cause, organization, project? Something like that or, or some sort of, um, there will be themes. And then you can just begin to notice your financial energy leaks. And that will be the same thing as your spiritual energy leaks or your emotional energy leaks or whatever because our, our money is just, it's just value. We're just shooting our value out the door. And if you're not doing that consciously and not spending things, spending money on things that you truly value, it's all fakakta. The system is off because it was designed simply for that, for what we value. So coming back to the issue about giving more value in order to receive more value, there I was with all my credit card debt in New York City feeling like a fraud, but actually, you know, my life looked really good from the outside. Inside, I knew it was all off. <laughs> so there was a moment when I was in the car with my mom. She was taking me to the airport, and I finally got up to the courage seat. Brilliantly, we figured that when we went into business together, we didn't need any sort of agreement. Didn't occur to us to write anything down. That's one of the <laughs> biggest mistakes you can ever make, especially when going into any financial relationship with somebody you love. Those are the ones that are the most rife with potential error because our love clouds us and we think that nothing could ever go wrong because love is enough, which it never is. So there we were. And I was feeling a little like, ooh, I don't feel like I'm getting compensated enough. And she, like, she was feeling a little resentful. We were like, Ugh. it was just feeling contracted. And so I said, basically I asked her, you know, when would we be moving the partnership into more of a 50-50 scenario, more da 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 and ultimately, I won't go into the details of the conversation, but it became very clear, very fast, that not only we were, we're, we were not on the same page, we were not even in the same book. And this, had been a, this is a business we had built for three and a half years. She was not at fault, I was not at fault, we had been at fault together, not getting clear. That's all it was. Clarity is power, and so clarity around our money creates power for us financially whether that's in an agreement that you have with somebody else, whether that's knowing how much you have in your checking account and how much you have in your um, investment accounts and what you're invested in, all of that stuff is really important because what we put our attention on grows. So if you want to attract more financial abundance, you want to put your attention on what you already have, which is why the bank account checking every morning really makes sense. Putting our attention on what we have, giving gratitude for what we already have, it's like fertilizer just makes it expand, it makes it grow. And I will tell you, I started making more money 
without doing any other practices, just from checking my bank account balance every morning and giving gratitude. I started getting, I also stopped overdrawing my checking account because I knew how much was in there. Hello. That was, <laughs> that was an obvious one, but it took me a while to get it. So I realized we were totally not on the same page here. And I also realized my staying small in this relationship, hitching my wagon to my mom's and never really stepping out, never really saying what I wanted to say, never really fully giving my value, was not only keeping me small, it was keeping her small. Because we can't actually be in relationship with somebody where we're shrinking ourselves and have that be good for another person as well. It's not possible to be in wrong relationship with somebody and have that be good for them. It's just not how the world works. So through a series of really loving conversations, we, we extricated ourselves from that. And as a result, afterwards, she and I made more money individually with clarity around what we were actually doing. I fell in love, got a book deal, ended up being able to share my value in a lot of ways that I wasn't able to, and as a result, have made more money, and as a result, managed to pay off my credit card debt basically in one fell swoop. And that was only because I was willing to, number one, get clear and tell the truth. So I'm gonna give you a little rubric for like, okay. And I think you can tell me afterwards, I don't know, email me or something. <laughs> I think this will work for pretty much any financial situation. We'll see, this will be an experiment. Number one, get clear. That means writing down how much you owe and to whom and what the APR balance is, what the annual percentage rate is. Number two, tell the truth. So I remember the moment I was standing with my mom in an elevator and I had not told anybody how much debt I was in and I was mortified and I just was, it was such, it was so awkward. And I was like, mom, I'm in $20,000 worth of debt. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, that's a lot. And I was like, I know. <laughs> but what that did is saying it out loud, the things that we think are dark and the things that we think are shameful and the things that we don't want anybody to see, when we bring them out into the light, it lightens them up. And suddenly I realized, oh, I'm not a bad person. This doesn't make me wrong. I'm not, like, I didn't, it's, it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It just means that I did some behaviors that were unconscious and I can now begin to unravel that because it's out in the light and now I can actually see it. When we keep our stuff in the dark, we can't see it clearly and it becomes bigger then you know how when you're looking in the dark you actually can't see the shape of things and they could be 10 times bigger than what they actually are and then you turn on the light and it's like, oh, this is a little thing, it's a little credit card debt. Well, just <laughs> pay it off. And so that's the number two step is to tell the truth. Ideally to somebody, to yourself, that's the most important one, obviously, right? But ideally just to somebody else who's really loving, who loves you unconditionally, and perhaps who has a little more financial uh, well-being than you do. So if you're working on getting out of debt, if you're working on how to organize a business deal, if you're working on a divorce decree, whatever, or even just a business plan, recommend, I recommend taking advice from somebody who just has maybe like a baby click of more success in that area than you do, because obviously we don't want to take advice from people who don't have what we want. But we do it all the time, don't we? Like, our mother will tell us, you know, oh, you should do this such and thing with your dating life, but she's not in a happy relationship. So you're like, well, why am I listening to you? But we do. So that's another thing. Side advice. <laughs> don't take advice from people who don't have what you want. And you don't know that I have what you want, so you can ask me later if I have the thing, and then you can take my advice. Um, so the clarity, the truth. And then this is where the most fun part comes in. This is where the love part comes in. We have to love ourselves exactly where we are. I cannot beat myself up enough to get a six-pack abs, right? I can't beat myself up for eating ice cream enough for my, for my abs to get tighter. I can't, I mean, I'm sorry, I can't hate myself enough. I needed to re-switch that. I can't hate myself enough for that. I can't beat myself up enough for overspending. I can't find myself wrong enough times for overspending to stop that behavior. We don't work that way. We're not wired that way. Beating ourselves into submission doesn't create change. 
So we want to act as though we're a small, lovely little child who we love unconditionally. Maybe you have your own kid or you have somebody else's kid you can imagine here. And then think about, well, what would I tell myself if I were five, standing there looking up at myself like the most lovable little perfect being, I wouldn't be like, what's wrong with you? How could you do this over and over and over again? Which is what I was doing for many years, which is why I stayed in debt. So there might be, this might be your financial life, it might be your physical health, it might be your love life, whatever area it is, we all have one. And they're all connected. When you change one area, it changes all of them, so it doesn't even really matter, right? <laughs> so find that area and see if there's a way that you can love yourself a little more right exactly where you are and notice, this might be really hard when you're right in the thick of it, but notice the reasons why being in that exact spot and the way that you got there is actually perfect for your own journey this time around. So you don't want to bypass feeling bad about it because sometimes it just feels like crap and you just need to feel that for a second, but then you can look at, okay, wow, it really is interesting that I spent all those years in credit card debt because and, and selling myself short business-wise and being in that little confused business relationship with my mom and various other things. I could tell you a million stories, but I won't today. It's really perfect that that ended up happening in that exact way for my soul's journey because who would I be to be up here telling you about it if I hadn't gone through it? If I was like, well, I grew up, it was a great childhood, and then, um, you know, and then I always did really well with money, and then I had money, and then so you can too. What? <laughs> You know, so I'm not saying you have to struggle in order to be a good teacher because sometimes there are teachers who really have, you know, have it all laid out and just are really gifted in that area and there are certain areas for that too, but, um, but that's one of the pieces. So, so love yourself right there and then find ways to be more loving and have more fun because that's a loving energy in relationship with your money. So whether that is renaming your bills folder, invoices for blessings already received, getting into gratitude, whether that is wearing cute underwear when you go meet with your financial advisor, yeah. wh I'm serious, whether that is having a financial freedom date with yourself, this is what I do, I have a financial freedom date with myself on Fridays, generally speaking, depending on my travel schedule, and I make sure my desk is clean, I burn a candle, I get myself a fun, like, fizzy beverage of some sort, usually with a lime, served in a wine glass, and I put on fun, sexy music. Because I know that the more expanded and the more fun I'm having around my money, and the more attention I'm willing to put on it, the more it will grow. So those are just a few key aspects to incorporate that into your life. And really, our spiritual journey and our spiritual lives are about feeling good, right? Don't we all, like, don't we all really just want to feel good, ultimately? That, is that not why you meditate? Is that not why you show up on your yoga mat? Is that not why we really do anything? I know that human beings will do more to avoid pain than they will to move towards pleasure, but that is still making a decision based on wanting to feel good. And so we only want money because we're hoping, and this comes back to the issue about it's money doesn't buy us happiness, it doesn't really directly, like, like if you hand me a stack of bills, that doesn't make me feel happy. But I can tell you that the things I'm able to do in my life, the freedom and the choices that I have, because I have that money in the palm of my hand, make me way happier than if I didn't have those choices. So that's that aspect, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop my chatting with you. I mean, I'm gonna keep chatting. I'm gonna stop my chatting alone. <laughs> I'm going to chat with you. So does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? And sometimes money is one of those scary things it's actually not polite to talk about. So one of my recommendations as well is to simply talk more about money. Maybe get a group of girlfriends together and do kind of like a money chat group. Actually really bring it out into the light and talk about it more because you will learn so much more having casual chats with your girlfriends than you will reading the Wall Street Journal. I mean, that's good too, but... So, so just bringing it out into the light. So any questions? Yes. Terry. <laughs> yes, you. So if you have a situation, you had a situation, you were talking about being in debt and all that. I think my, my question is about having a bad financial situation happen when you're not 20. Mm -hmm. Oh, and great question.
that kind of a Bernie Madoff situation, not mm. exactly him, but like him. Right. Um, and trying to find my way back from that mm. and not have it come between my husband and myself, mm -hmm. I had to work on all those things. So what are your thoughts about that? Mm. So glad you asked that question. So in case you guys didn't hear Terry, what she said is, what if you find yourself in a bad situation, like, for example, in kind of a Bernie Madoff situation, if you invested with somebody who ran off with your money, for example, um, and you're not at 22 living in your mom's house, right? Because <laughs> that's a very special kind of situation. So, and how do you, how do you unravel yourself from that without having it take a toll on your relationship with your husband, having it take a toll on your relationship with your health, because that's a really important piece as well. Our physical health is really linked with what's going on financially and otherwise in our lives. So what my recommendation is, especially if you're dealing with a couple situation, is for the two of you to get really clear on what you actually value. Like what actually is important to you? What are the aspects? What are the, probably it won't be more than 10 things that bring you that feeling of, richness and abundance and wealth in your life. When we look at those things, what we find out is financial freedom, both emotionally and literally, financial freedom literally is when your passive or residual income is greater than your living expenses. So you can make passive or residual income various ways and that's kind of, it's a separate conversation. But <laughs> what we find is that financial freedom emotionally and literally is less expensive than we often think because the media whips us up into a froth thinking like, it's gotta be about the bigger boat, it's gotta be about the diamonds, it's gotta be about the Hummer, it's gotta be about all that stuff. And it's okay if it is for you, right? Because there are certain material things, like I was so happy to buy these jeans. I really valued them, that money was so well spent. This is actually a material thing, when I put it on, it makes me happier. It, I swear to God, <laughs> they, they do. So those things, make a list together, because that'll be a fun exercise, right? It doesn't get into like the who'sy what's it's of the dollar signs and the decimal points and it gets, but you can come to that really expansive, what really do we value? And then how can we make all of our financial efforts align with those things that we value first and the way we wanna feel? So if you know it's really important to you to feel healthy and energized, great. So you know the gym membership, that's gonna stay. But if you realize like, okay, well we're spending, you know, I was spending $500 a year on this travel membership that I never used. I didn't, I don't value like luxury fancy pants travel that much and I wasn't ever using it. So that's obviously a thing to shave off, right? <laughs> right? So when you wanna be, have more freedom financially, you can both expand your income, increase your income, and you can also decrease your expenses in a way that doesn't make you feel deprived. Because the difference is, I was not willing to stop spending more than I made because it felt like deprivation to me. It felt like I was a bad girl, it felt like I had to start wearing orthopedic shoes and like ugly outfits, and it felt like really constrictive and oh, only people who have poverty mentality pay attention to their expenses. That's what I thought. Instead, what I realized is, if we can take a look at our expenses and align them with who we truly are and what we truly want, it all kind of comes out in the wash. Like you have to pay attention to it, but it becomes glaringly obvious what things you can shave away, what things can go to the side from a place of self-love and from a place of knowing like, hey, if I stop spending $500 a year on that travel membership, that money that I'm saving, I like to call it the money for me account. So that money, I would take those $500 and put it in the money for me account which I would use towards buying other things that really did align with my values, investing, saving, or at the time paying off my debt. So when you start think, stop thinking of it as, oh, I'm not gonna spend that, therefore I have less, oops. Instead, I'm not gonna spend money on that because it doesn't align with my values, it doesn't feel good, therefore I have more because that's going into the money for me expense, uh, uh, um, account. Does that make sense? Yes, and it, it actually, I appreciate that. I'm totally gonna do it. Okay, great. Right. It's always, the, the freedom comes from choice. The freedom and the happiness does not come from money. It comes from what money allows us to do, be, or have in our lives. Because I don't think anybody would disagree with me that if you have um, debt and no money in your bank account, and if you have you know, $100,000 to spare, 
like the debt and poor and not having money, that doesn't feel good. That's not happiness, <laughs> right? So, so the idea that money doesn't bring us happiness, no, it's not direct, but it definitely helps. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm in a situation where I feel like I give a lot of value mm -hmm. relative to what I get. Mm. I was talking to one of my mentors and I was saying, like, I'm self-employed and uh, with my clients, I feel like I should be charging more, but I'm afraid to ask for more. And she right. said to me, ironically, she said, you know, Stephen, if you're afraid to ask for what you want, on some level, you don't think you deserve it. Yeah. And that really resonated with me for whatever reason, but I just felt like I provide a lot of, for what I get and what I give. So what is it the other, like, to me, the concept of providing yeah. I'm so glad you're asking this question. There are two sides to that. One is maybe you need to add more value in the world, right? Maybe you need to uh, do a product or a service in a new way that you haven't thought of that adds value to somebody's life that they, they're like so excited for that. Maybe you're on the other side of the coin. Maybe it's more of a receiving issue. Because a lot of times there's actually value coming at us and it's like, hey, 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 but we're over here in I don't deserve it land or we're over here in it's too much land or we're over here in oh no, you shouldn't have land. And we actually just can't even turn to know, oh my God, oh wow, thank you. Like I didn't even know you were over here because I was too busy thinking I'm not enough. So sometimes it's actually a receiving issue. <laughs> and so the receiving issue comes down to Noticing what you have already. I'm sure you're probably already good at that. So getting more into a gratitude practice, noticing the ways in which you're already receiving value. And then also allowing others to give you value in other ways. So maybe in your practice, or I don't know your business, but maybe in your business, you know, you're not gonna raise your rates immediately, although I think you probably should based exactly on what you said, like you totally need to raise your rates. Um, that just seems fairly obvious from what you just said. Yep. Like one client leaving puts me in a situation. So, but I know that I deserve more. Yeah. So you're, are you somebody who, when you look at items that are available to you, you're like, you're buying jelly. <laughs> and, and, and you see a jelly that's like local and, and beautiful, or like an artisanal jelly, and that one's $12. And then you look at this other jelly, and it's like Smuckers, and it's $1.50. Do you value the, the artisanal jelly more? Would you buy the, the $12 one or would you buy the $1.50 one? And this is not, there's not a right answer. Neither. You I wouldn't either. Well, I would buy, I like local, yep. but not when the price difference is $11. Okay, great. Right? So to me, it's important that like sustainable and local. Yep, sustainable and local. Like $11.50 Okay, so $12 is a lot for jam, but that's not <laughs> the point of my story is, or the point of what I'm trying to get to is, oftentimes we value what we have to pay for yeah. more than if we didn't have to pay as much. Like I know if I'm looking at products and services and I'm looking at a graphic designer and one charges $50 for something and one charges $500 for something, if I buy the $50 thing, like, to me, that's not as valuable because she's not charging as much, and so I know that she probably doesn't value her own work as much. So when it comes down to you taking that leap and raising your rates and the fear of losing a client, what's really important to know is when you raise your rate to match how you value yourself, and, and you're gonna have to stretch it a little bit, right? Because it's always, you have to do it so that it makes you slightly uncomfortable but not terrified. So there's a sweet spot in there. Um, and you can, you can sit with actually different values and like conjure up, okay, so I'm going to just raise my rate to a thousand, you know, for this thing and then feel how that feels in your body. And if it gets you a little excited and tingly and you're like, ooh, that feels good. And then versus like, okay, I'm going to raise my rates to 5,000 and you're like, ah, that, then you'll know because you'll feel it. Um, so what you'll find, and this, this just happens when you are willing to take that little leap and raise your rates, 
your clients will probably be ordering more from you and you'll get new clients to fill the gap and you'll have more spaciousness and freedom in your schedule and the ones who stay will value your work more because anybody who's not willing to pay for what you feel you're worth is not actually worth your time and that's a devaluing of yourself to continue to use your time spending working with that person. Exactly. And you will be, when you make a statement of like, I am worth $1,000 an hour, I don't know what your business is, whatever, right? What happens is the world reorganizes to show you that that's true. It happens every time when you make a bold statement of your worth. You actually can't be treated less than how you value yourself. And, and raising your rates is a, is a pretty profound statement of your worth in the world. And so the world will reorganize in accordance. And you'll, you'll probably make way more money than you thought you would, and way more than be able to cover your expenses, even if a couple of clients fall away. And those clients may be the ones that irritate you when you're working with them anyway. You'll, you'll probably find that your business becomes more fun and more easy and more pleasurable which will then attract more money to you, and it's this beautiful dance where it's like more fun, more pleasure, more money, yeah, and more value, because that's what it's really about anyway, right? We don't want just the money sitting in our bank account. Uh, yeah, white pants. I'm kind of from the same standpoint, knowing that you may not gain like, your value when it comes to money that's income for the contribution that you're making, but from a corporate standpoint, mm -hmm. you don't get the opportunity to say, like, I'm making more money. Right. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm worth more today, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so one of the things when, how am I doing on time? Is it time? Two, Two more minutes, okay, great. So we're talking about asking for a raise. No. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah. great. What's really important, I, I find, when I've been in those situations, is first of all, really articulating and noticing and writing down, getting in writing somewhere just for yourself the ways in which you add tremendous value to the company and the ways in which you are worth that. Because writing it down and putting it on paper for yourself gives you the clarity to stand in that power of like, oh yeah, and I have a spreadsheet about why. Like, you don't have to do that, but you know you could. And that's really powerful. So stick that in your back pocket. You could literally actually do that. <laughs> but, or you could create literally a PowerPoint for yourself about why you are the shit and then put that together, do the PowerPoint, like do the presentation for yourself and then walk in from that place because you will absolutely be in a far more, uh, in a far better place to receive what you're asking when you come from that place as opposed to coming from the place, like that's a place of absolutely it's obvious. Totally I'm worth more. This is obvious and here's why. And you've actually given yourself the data for it. I don't think that blowing sparkles up our skirt and just being like, I'm amazing, I'm fabulous, without giving us the evidence as to why, is practical. I know there are a lot of teachers who will say that's absolutely practical and just like puff yourself up and walk in there, but then when, as soon as they waver, you'll be like, eh, you know, like I don't, okay, maybe I was wrong. But if you go in there from that place, they're like, oh, yeah, ab absolutely. Like, your energy field changes their energy field and will impact their emotional response to you. We make money decisions based on our limbic brain, which is back here, it's totally emotional. Always emotional. And so if you're coming in from the place of, here's my 10 point presentation on why I'm amazing, and here's how I add value, and here's how I am helping this company get more of what they want, right, because you always want to orient it around what's in it for them, not what's in it for you. Yes, perhaps a trip to Europe might be in it for you, but that's not the point in this conversation. <laughs> and when you come from that place, it changes the whole conversation. So give yourself the evidence. Actually spend some time loving yourself in that way, giving yourself a PowerPoint presentation or whatever, and then come in asking from a place of how can I help you. And this raise that you're going to give me, here are the ways it's going to help you as a company and here's how I'm gonna add value to the company as a result. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I think we're, we're done, time. Um, thank you all so much for being here, and I, if you didn't get your question answered, I'm happy to hang. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>